If you guys would open up with me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, we'll be reading verses 1 through 7. God's word for us this morning says this. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. A familiar of familiar portion of scripture to us, no doubt. We know it well, we've even memorized it. And John chapter 14 is one of the most comforting passages for a believer in all of scripture. It was Dr. A.L. Gabaline who used to say that among his family treasures was a German Bible that went back many generations. He said that one can open that Bible to some pages and it looked like it had just come off the press. But when opened to John chapter 14, it was spotted, soiled, and worn from the tears of many generations. You can just picture the saints over the years opening up to John chapter 14, crying over its promises, crying over what they are currently experiencing in the sin-cursed world that we live in today. We live in a world of trial and tribulation. I don't need to convince you of that at all. We are often tired of the world, our own flesh, our own sin, and the devil's schemes as the God of this world. What's our hope? What's our comfort as believers in this life right now? Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, Paul says that we wait for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We as believers derive great comfort from the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back to take us with him. And until he does, we as believers in this life must continually Look to Christ and trust what we'll see in this passage. We must look to him and trust his presence, his promises, and in his person. Those are the three points that we'll see in verses 1 through 7. Now I want to explain a little bit of context and background as to what's going on and where we're at in John's gospel because once we understand that, we will then be able to understand what Christ is saying in these passages. We are find ourselves right now in the middle of the upper room discourse with Jesus and the 11 disciples. I say 11 because we saw last time that Judas has just been dismissed to betray Jesus for the scriptures to be fulfilled. It is the night of Jesus' betrayal. Jesus is observing the Passover meal with his closest friends, his closest disciples, just hours before he will be caught, he will be handed over, and to be betrayed, arrested, abused, mocked, tortured, and ultimately crucified. Jesus has been warning the disciples time and time again that this was going to happen. This is not coming to the disciples by surprise. 
They are well aware of all that Jesus has been warning them. The hatred, the animosity in Jerusalem towards the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that animosity was raging hot this Thursday evening. The chief priests, scribes, Pharisees, elders, the councils, the Jews, they want his silence. And the only way to do that is to put him to death. The highest court in Israel wanted the disciple's master and friend put to death. Not only that, the nation of Israel is rejecting their Messiah, and they too want him silenced. But the disciples had left everything to follow him. They left their occupation, their friends and their families to follow Christ. I imagine some of the disciples' friends or people that they had known in their own lives had already begun to reject the disciples because of their affiliation with Christ. Matthew chapter 19 and verse 27, Peter says, Look, Lord, see, we have left everything to follow you. They had invested everything into Christ up to this point. And the disciples are told with all that's going to happen and that he's going to die, and then he says, I'm leaving. If you look there in John chapter 13 and verse 33, he says, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Not only was the Lord leaving them, but he's telling them that he was going somewhere where they were not going to be immediately able to follow him. And up to this point of John's gospel, to my knowledge, I look through the remaining chapters or the last few chapters, and Jesus hasn't said anything about him coming back. He's only been talking about him leaving to the disciples. They think in their minds that they're losing him for good. But we're not in their situation. We know the fullness of God's revelation. We know the story. We know that Jesus is not going to be leaving the disciples forever. He's going to come back. But the disciples don't know this in this moment. We have to understand that. One writer says this, If you have ever lost a close loved one, you know what permanent separation is like. You can only imagine the feeling of losing one who was perfect, whose fellowship was so pure, whose wisdom was so trustworthy, whose touch could heal any malady, whose strength was so reliable, whose love was so flawless. It must have been a bitter, overwhelming sense of profound loss. There's more. Not only that, but Judas had just been dismissed, and the 11 disciples are confused at the conversation that Jesus just had with Judas, and then he departs. Not only that, but Jesus had just told them that their leader, Peter, was going to deny him three times. There's more. Just a few days before this Thursday evening, in John chapter 12, And verse 27, when Jesus is talking about the hour to which he has come, he says, my hour has come. What is that hour? To go to the cross and all that it will take in that hour. And he says, now is my soul troubled. And we saw last time in John chapter 13, when Jesus is talking about Judas betraying him, Jesus was troubled in his spirit. So you have the troubling of the disciples with all that they're going through, and then they see their own Lord and Master also being troubled as well. But I mean, if there's anyone among them, including Jesus, that should be troubled, it's him. 
He knows that he is about to become a curse. He knows that he is about to drink down the bitter cup of God's wrath against sin. He also knows that his closest friends, his only friends at this moment, when he needs them the most, they are going to scatter. They're going to leave and they're going to be scared. He knows that Peter will deny him with a curse that he even knows who Jesus is. He knows the thorns are coming. He knows those actual nails are going to be driven through his hands and in his feet. He knows the suffocation, and he knows that he is going to die. If anyone should be troubled in this moment, it's Christ. And yet, in the midst of Jesus', Jesus greatest hours of distress and troubling, he seeks the comfort and benefit of his friends instead. That's a true leader. He was touched with the feelings of his disciples' infirmities. He felt and shared their sorrows. The disciples couldn't feel his pain, his troubling, because at the moment, they are too self-focused on their own circumstances. But as the perfect Savior, as their perfect friend, as their perfect elder brother, He seeks to comfort them instead of himself when he needs it way more than they do. But there's also a fulfillment of prophecy that's going on in our passage. You'll look at time and time again in the book of Isaiah and see the character that's explained of the servant of the Lord. That's a a term, a title given to the Messiah, the servant of the Lord who will come. In Isaiah chapter 50, one of those servant songs, in Isaiah 50 and verse 4, the Messiah The servant of the Lord speaks and says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of those that are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Just follow me for a second. In Isaiah chapter 61, a real familiar passage to us, when it's showing all that the Messiah will do when he comes to the earth. In Isaiah 61 This is the future Messiah speaking and says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to do what? To bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and to comfort all who mourn. This is what the Messiah will do when he comes to the earth. This is his character. This is his manner. This is his mission. This is his goal. What will he do? He will comfort his people who mourn. What's Jesus doing right now to his people? He's comforting them who mourn. He's fulfilling prophecy without them even knowing what's going on. With all the background of what's going on right now, he looks to the disciples and he tells them, Do not be troubled. It's a command. It's the first command in our passage. And he's not telling them to not start being troubled. They already were troubled. He is telling them to stop being troubled. I don't know about you, but when I'm nervous, anxious, or worried, and someone just tells me, just stop. Just stop. It it normally never works. I need good reason. My wife goes through through this with me for for years now. I'm one of those parents that worries a lot of family and friends and especially my children, whom I'm a protector and provider, and they're my responsibility. And I'm one of those parents where as soon as I go to bed and my head hits the pillow— I start thinking of all those hypotheticals. What if someone comes in the window and takes my little girl? 
What if we're in the forest and a bear comes out of nowhere and eats all of my children? What if my youngest, Amaya, grows down the driveway and she gets ran over by a truck? I mean, it consumes my mind, especially when I'm, at, when I'm about to go to sleep. And sometimes I'll wake up, I can't go to sleep, sometimes I'm sweating, and I come out and I tell my wife many things of what I'm thinking about, and she's just rolling her eyes and she just says, just stop. It just never works. It never, ever works. I need good reason. Jesus doesn't simply tell the disciples, just stop being troubled. He tells them that, and he gives them many, many reasons for them not to be troubled in their current situation. He wants the disciples to be comforted in their greatest hours of distress. And the way that they can be comforted is in those three ways that we're going to see. They need to trust his presence, they need to trust his promises, and they need to trust in his person. So there first, they need to trust in his presence. Now look there in chapter 14 and verse 1. He says, let not your hearts be troubled, or rather, do not let your heart be troubled. That's an imperative. That's a command. He is commanding them not to be troubled, okay? And then next he says, believe in God. And really, should you believe in God? That can be an indicative, okay? That is a statement of fact. I don't think he's calling them to believe in God, in Yahweh. He knows that they already believe in God. It's an indicative. You believe in God. He is affirming that they believe in the Father. He is affirming that they have belief in the one true and living God. You believe in God right now, he is saying to them, though you do not see him. And now the imperative, believe also in me. There's a difference there. He is not saying, you also do believe in me. He's calling them to believe in him the same way that they currently believe in God himself. Now, many in Israel's history believed in God without ever seeing him. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was counted to him as righteousness without ever seeing his face. Moses stands up before the nation of Israel and says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, without seeing him face to face. David writes in Psalm 25, But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord, I say, you are my God, without ever seeing him. David says in Psalm 31, with confidence, when I'm afraid, I will put my trust in you, though I do not see you. Many in Israel believed in what God had revealed to them up to the point in which they lived. His promises, his prop prophecies, his nature, his person, without ever seeing him face to face. Yes, there was Christophanies, there was Theophanies all throughout the Old Testament, but they never saw God face to to face. And Jesus is saying to the disciples, you believe in God. You believe in Yahweh of the Old Testament right now, though you do not see him. And then he says to them, in that same way, also believe in me. Christ is affirming his deity right there by putting himself on par with the Father as an equal person to be worshipped, to receive equal worship and to receive equal trust just as much as the disciples trust in God the Father. The disciples needed to be prepared to trust in Christ's presence even after he was going to leave them. I imagine that it wasn't only Thomas that struggled with doubt to believe the things that he could not see. You remember the reluctance of Thomas to believe that Christ had been truly resurrected. In John chapter 20, 
Thomas says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of his hands and place my hands into his side, I will never believe. That's a very low level of faith by Thomas. Jesus comes, you know, and shows Thomas his wish and says, Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who believe and have not seen me, or blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Before Jesus ascends in Matthew chapter 28, that last promise he tells to the disciples, he says, Behold, I am with you always. That's not going to change when I ascend. I am with you always. Always. Peter was there in the upper room. And in 1 Peter 1.18, when he speaks of Christ, he says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Has anyone ever seen Jesus Christ face-to-face here today? No. You've never seen him face-to-face. But yet he is more real to you than anyone in existence, is he not? He is real. He is alive, though you do not see him face-to-face. Yet the Spirit of God and the Word of God continually bear witness to us in our conflict, in our disappointment, in our fears, in our severe trial, continually bear witness to us of his trustworthy presence. And that's what Jesus is trying to show the disciples. They need to trust his presence even when he leaves. Point number two, we are comforted when we trust in his promises. He says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? A way to comfort the disciples was to show them that this separation wouldn't be permanent. There's a few things that we learn in these just short few words that I just read in verse 2. We understand that the Father's house that Christ is talking about is very large, big enough to house at least each of the disciples so far. It's the Father's house, and he lives with his children What's the Father's house? The Father's house is another name for heaven. Heaven is described as a country in Scripture due to its vastness. A city because God is its king. Paradise because of its beauty. It's referred to as a place of rest for the redeemed. Now, I don't think anybody here has the King James Version, but maybe you did at one point, and you read... In my father's house are many mansions. Well, it's not mansions. It's best translated rooms or even suites. Mansions, it sounds like we're all going to live in a town and everyone's going to have their own mansion and we're going to be maybe blocks away from each other. But that's not the picture. In my house, in my father's house are many rooms or suites. And we all live together in the Father's house. Now understand this, Jesus is simply describing a single glorious home with enough dwelling places to encompass the complete family of God. That's what he's getting at. There will be no overcrowding in the Father's house. You will not get there and see no vacancy signs. It will be able to house the complete family of God. Now, here's my question. Twice in verses 2 and 3, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. 
What does he mean by the preparing? What needs to be prepared? Is the house of God incomplete? Once Jesus ascends and he's there, the right hand of the Father, is he building our rooms in his spare time? How can he say in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34, describing the final judgment when the Son of Man will say from his glorious throne, the king says, come you on my right who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared when? For you from the foundation of the world. What needs to be prepared? What is Christ talking about? I don't know if I'm completely convinced of everything that he is saying. It's been difficult for me, but here's a couple of things. There are for sure things that do need to be prepared as of right now when Jesus utters these words. There are some things right now when Jesus utters these words that need to be ready. And Jesus is saying, I must go to make them ready. What needs to be prepared? What needs to happen? One, sin must be atoned for, and it hasn't yet. I think Jesus is saying in these words, I haven't paved the way to the Father's house yet. My work isn't complete. The wrath of God against sin has not yet been satisfied. I have not been crushed for your iniquities. My Father has not laid on me the iniquity of all of our people. I have not yet been led to the slaughter as a sacrifice for sin. I have yet to conquer death. I have yet to fulfill all prophecy. I have yet to fully give my life as a ransom for many. I have yet to fulfill all righteousness. I have yet to crush the serpent's head. I have yet to pave the way for you to even enter into my Father's house. Do you see? I think that there's more going on in this passage than just the preparations of heaven for our rooms. Let me just kind of recap for a minute with what we've seen and where we're going. He is saying to the disciples, the 11 disciples, do not be troubled. As you have believed in the one true and living God, believe also in me. I am going to prepare all things for you. Do not hold on to me. I am going to, beginning this night, to destroy every obstacle in between you and your rooms in the Father's house. The way, the way to the Father's house isn't prepared just yet. We can say as of right now when Jesus utters these words, heaven's doors are shut sealed tight without entry until he does what? Until he goes to the cross, until he's resurrected, until he ascends and does all that the Father has commissioned him to do. It's reminiscent of what we saw in Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus begins to explain to the disciples earlier on in his ministry, and he says to the disciples that he would suffer many things and be killed and that these things must happen. But then you remember Peter pulls Jesus aside and rebukes Jesus and says, Lord, this can never be. And Jesus simply says to Peter, what? Get behind me, Satan. Peter don't you dare get in the way of what my mission is. Don't you dare get in the way of what I have come to this earth to do. I must suffer. I must be killed. 
I must atone for sin. I must prepare everything for my bride. Now, I know I mentioned heaven, and I probably piqued a little bit of your interest, and I'm not really talking a lot about it, so let me just give you a little bit just to whet your appetite. Heaven, as we know, church, is promised to us, and we know that it is a place that is of indescribable beauty, and it's a glorious place. You can go back and read Revelation 21 that explains the new heavens and the new earth that will be ours one day. And it also describes in the new heavens and new earth all that it contains. Revelation 20 describes the city in which we will dwell as a cube. And the size of that cube will be 12,000 stadia. Do you guys know how big that is? No? It's about 1,500 miles. That size in two dimensions is 225 million square miles. Sounds big. You probably still don't even know how big that is. The greater London area is only 607 miles compared to 225 million million square miles. It's estimated that 100 billion people could easily live there with comfort. It's enough room for everyone. It's 1,728 billion cubic miles. It's an area larger than you and I can really conceive in our mind. It will be the house, the Father's house, where all of us, all of the redeemed, will live comfortably forever and ever. And yet, as glorious as all of that is, it excites us. We long for it. Unbroken fellowship with God and his people. No pain, no worry, no doubt, no fear, no death, no sin, no trouble, no offenses, no arguments, no masks. I think if Jesus would have begun to describe the beauty of heaven right now to the disciples and all of its benefits, I don't think all of it really would have mattered to them as long as they're assured that Jesus is going to be there. All that heaven will have, it excites me. I look forward to it. I know what's awaiting me. Can't wait. But honestly, you can take all of it away as long as Jesus is there. Charles Spurgeon writes, he says this, I bear testimony that there is no joy to be found in all this world like the sweet, like that of the sweet communion with Christ. I would barter all else there is of heaven for that. Indeed, that is heaven. As for the harps of gold in the streets like clear glass and the songs of seraphs and the shouts of the redeemed, one could very well give all these up, counting them as a drop in a bucket if we might forever live in fellowship and communion with Jesus Christ. Did you get that? He continues one more. Oh, to think of heaven without Christ. It is the same thing as thinking of hell. Heaven without Christ, it is day without sun, existing without life, feasting without food, seeing without light, It involves a contradiction in terms. Heaven without Christ, absurd. 
It is the sea without water, the earth without its fields, the heavens without their stars. There cannot be a heaven without Christ. He is the sum total of bliss, the fountain from which heaven flows, the element of which heaven is composed. Christ is heaven and heaven is Christ. There in verse 3, he says to the disciples, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. That is one of the greatest promises in this passage to the disciples and for you now today, if you are in a relationship with Jesus Christ, to be with him forever in glory. That is heaven. It was John Piper I just read and listened to this week who said that the essence of heaven for believers is the immediate presence of Jesus Christ. Point number three, we gain comfort as Christ's disciples when we trust in his person. Verse 4, Jesus says, and you know the way to where I am going. Jesus assures the disciples that they know the way and to not worry. Verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Of course, doubting Thomas is the one who is perplexed and speaks up. Thomas has always been the example in Scripture of the slow-minded believer. But give him a break. We've all had our times of weakness and doubt And if you think of all the distress that Thomas is going through on this night, you would understand. So Thomas is, of course, thinking as literal as possible, and he objects. Wait, I don't know where you are going. Was there a a, a meeting that I missed where you explained the way? Was there a a, a map given out that I, I don't have? He's thinking as literal as possible. I missed that meeting, Jesus. I do not know where you're going or the way to get there. And Jesus says to Thomas, I am the way. What's he saying by that? He is saying to Thomas and the disciples, You do know the way because you know me. He's saying, Thomas, if I am the object of your faith, then you do know the way. Thomas, if you're putting all of your trust in me, Thomas, if you're putting all of your hope in me as the object of your faith, then you do know the way. And he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. I always looked at that passage, and I couldn't really understand as much as I definitely understand just in this past week. What's he saying exactly? With the structure, Jesus is saying, I am the only way to the Father's house. I am the only way to God. That's why he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the only way to God because I alone am the truth about God and because I alone possess the life of God. Do you understand that? 
I am the only way to God because I alone know the truth about God and I alone possess the life of God. John chapter 1 and verse 14, you know it well. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. John chapter 1 and verse 4 describing the glories of Christ that was coming to the earth. In him was life. John chapter 11 and verse 25, we saw a few weeks ago, when Christ declares and says, I am the resurrection and the life. I, only I, have the power over death and the power of life. Christ is saying, I am the truth. I am the root of of all knowledge is to know me. I am the true Messiah to whom all revelation points to. I am the truth of which all the Old Testament ceremonies and sacrifices were a figure and a shadow because of me. And he, anyone that really knows me, knows enough to take him to heaven. And he says, I am the life. I am the root and fountain of all life, physical, spiritual, eternal life, all rests in me. So that if anybody has life, it's given to them, physical or eternal, it is because I have given it to them. I am the redeemer from death and the only giver of eternal life. And he Anyone that believes and knows me will have a glorious life in the Father's house. Listen closely, church. I listened to even Bodhi uh, a couple days ago. And he was talking about the believer's hope for heaven. And he said this, real simple. The believer's hope for heaven is the continuation of an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. The believer's hope for heaven is the continuation of an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. In verse 4, Jesus affirms to Thomas and says, You know the way to where I am going. Why? Because you know me. You have a relationship with me. You don't just know about me. You don't just have some form of intellectual knowledge about who I am You know who I am, and you have forsaken all to have a relationship with me. When we die, understand this church, when anybody dies for that matter, it will not be the start of a relationship with God. When believers die and we go to heaven, it's the continuation and the culmination of a relationship with Jesus Christ. It amazes me that people who have no visible relationship with Jesus Christ say that when they die, they're going to heaven and they actually desire to go to heaven. Just explain what heaven is and they should be stunned. Unbroken fellowship with God, his son, the spirit with all of the redeemed. That's what heaven is. And unbelievers across the world say, I'm going there, but do none of that in the life they live right now. They give no allegiance to him, no submission, no repentance of a sinful lifestyle that Christ, Christ came to actually die for. Show him no love, give him no attention, spend no time with Christ, knowing his word, knowing his people, spending time with his people. And they say, yeah, 
I'm going to heaven. I'm going to go to the place where I give no attention to right now. The picture here is of a marriage relationship between Christ and his people, Christ and his bride. We believers of the Lord Jesus Christ have entered into a permanent, growing, and lasting marriage relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we never want that to be taken away. Friend, if any of you are hoping that on your deathbed, days before you die, that you're going to somehow have a change of heart and you're all of a sudden going to desire the glories of heaven and unbroken fellowship with God, do not put your trust in that whatsoever. It will not work. I remember J.C. Ryle saying in one of his books, I have rarely seen a deathbed type of transformation, regeneration, where someone on their deathbed gets saved and goes right to heaven. Can it happen? Absolutely. J.C. Ryle's just saying, I have rarely have ever seen that ever happen. If you're joining us today, that will not work. Your faith needs to be in a person. And your faith needs to be in a person right here and right now. Do not put it off any longer. You will sear your conscience over and over and over again. And Romans says, Romans chapter 1, Paul says that God will just finally give you over. Today is the day of salvation. Salvation from the consequences of your sin can be forgiven today. If you would come willingly to Jesus Christ to be forgiven, redeemed, restored, and enter into a permanent covenant relationship with the second person of the Trinity to be with him forever. Heaven for us as believers starts now at the moment of salvation. As we close, just one last encouragement for us, church. All of us who have, by God's grace, by his choosing, by his power, have entered into a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's just one thing I saw this week I want to share with you. You remember in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen gets up and gives that sermon, that defense to the Jewish leaders concerning Christ as their true Messiah. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 54, the Jewish leaders, when they heard what Stephen had said, they ground their teeth at him and they were putting him to death. They were stoning him to death because he was given glory to Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah. And it says in chapter 7 and verse 54, but he, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. We often speak of Jesus ascending and what? Seating at the right hand of God. Well, what's the point? It's this. When one of Jesus' chosen ones dies, one of his sheep go to him, one of those who make up his glorious bride, Jesus, the bridegroom, stands to welcome us into his home that he has prepared for us. He stands to welcome his bride as the perfect bridegroom. We, church, are comforted only and always because our faith rests in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, you know the cry of our own hearts. 
you know that we know that this is not our home. We experience turmoil. We experience fear. We experience doubt. We even get tired of our remaining flesh. We get tired of the sin that still remains in us as your new creatures in Christ. We long for the day, our Lord, where sin will be ultimately done away with. We will be delivered fully and finally from the presence of sin to be with you in glory. As believers, we confess we ultimately don't care what heaven has to offer if you're not there. Christ, we want to be where you are. We ask that in this short life that we have remaining, you would give us that joy that's inexpressible and full of glory as we seek your presence. Of course, we long for the day when we'll be able to see you for who you really are and see you face to face. What joy comfort, satisfaction, fulfillment, and glory will be felt by the redeemed in those days. Thank you for the sweet, undeserved fellowship that you give to us on a daily basis. It's often said that there's strength in numbers, and I pray that even here in our local church, we would be able to, by your grace, feel and experience the confidence that we should have as a unit, those who strive for unity and those of us who have entered into a covenant relationship with you. Lord, may you be glorified in all of our evangelistic endeavors May you be glorified and help us in the work of bringing the gospel more and more to those who do not know the way, who do not know that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can come to the Father except through you. Jesus, help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of you so that we would be useful to you as our King, as our Lord, our Master, our Friend. May you be glorified in all of this. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.